flashing to all my viewers and all of you who are probably listening to this recording after the fact. You are now tuned into Siren Sundays. And today's episode, our guest is Dr. Nicholas Higgs, who is the director of the Cape Luther Institute. And this episode is also proudly sponsored by the Bahamas Protected Areas Fund that we'll hear a little bit more about in the middle of this episode. So welcome, Dr. Higgs. How are you doing today on this beautiful Sunday? Hello, I'm doing very well, thanks. Um, enjoying this beautiful Sunday indeed. Definitely. So let's jump right in. Can you give us a quick background about yourself and how your journey progressed to get you even into deep sea creatures? <laughs> okay. Well, um, I am uh, a marine biologist. I like to say I've been a marine biologist since I was about five years old. Um, I grew up close to the sea on um, the island of Spanish Wells in North Eleuthera. So always kind of grew up um, enjoying the, the marine habitat, the beaches in the boat. Um, my whole family are fishermen. I come from a long line of fishermen. So I was, you know, I was, I remember jumping in the sea before I could even swim. Um, literally used to go um, jumping off the cliffs or off the bridge before I could even swim. So loved the water from an early age. Um, and I was kind of one of those lucky people that have somehow ended up doing the thing that I kind of always wanted to do. Um, that said, it's definitely not um, what, what I thought it would be, you know. I think um, that, that kind of idea changes as, as you get older. But um, so, yeah, I, I went to school, primary school at Spanish Wells All Age, and then um, went on to do high school at a school in England. Um, my, my mother's British, my dad's Bahamian, um, so that's how I ended up at school in England. I went to high school there and then went on to do a degree in marine biology at the University of Southampton, so I stayed over in England for college. Um, and that, that was a kind of four-year integrated master's, which was really cool. It was a new degree at the time, so there was only like 12 of us on it, so we were kind of a a close-knit team and that gave me lots of cool experiences um, including my first taste of working on deep sea stuff you know being a Bahamian you think like okay I'm gonna go away get my education come back and I'll be working on like coral reefs and rubus and lobsters and all kinds and one of my my uh, professors at the university there was probably one of the, the world experts on deep sea biology um, Professor Paul Tyler, he literally wrote the textbook on it. And I took a course with him. And one of the bases of the courses was this project that he'd done in the Bahamas. So I was like all excited to do this course and find out more about deep sea stuff. Um, and, and so got really into it. And then my, my tutor, um, we were looking for an under, undergraduate or a project, a thesis project to do like a research project. And he said, oh, well, I, I got a friend at the Natural History Museum who might be able to set you up with a project. And, and that was worth looking at um, diversity patterns in deep sea sea stars, um, particularly brittle stars. Um, and that was, that was really fun. And that was my kind of first entry into the wonderful world at the Natural History Museum in London, which is one of the oldest and biggest museums in the world. And then I went on to do my PhD um, at the Natural History Museum, but also with the University of Leeds, um, which was, and that carried on in the deep sea theme, but also bringing in some paleontology. Um, so that was really cool, got to do a, a big mix. Um, and really, really enjoyed my time working there. That was another three or four years. And then I stayed on. Um, at the Natural History Museum, working there um, on this project we'll talk about a bit later, this deep sea ID app project. Um, and after that, I got a job at the University of Plymouth um, and kind of shifted my research focus a little bit, actually got into some more stuff back here in the Bahamas. Um, and kind of, you know, really, and then got a, a sort of full-time position there um, as the deputy director of the Marine Institute um, at, at Plymouth University. Um, and the whole time was kind of thinking of, okay, I want to get back to the Bahamas, I want to work in the Bahamas, but never really thought that 
there was somewhere that I could, I could find to work here. Um, now, particularly, I don't know where your listeners are and they might want to cover their ears for this part, but <laughs> being a family island boy, I had already decided I, you know, I'm, I'm going to Nassau. <laughs> um, if, I don't blame <laughs> you. So, so I, I, was, I kind of was working over there um, happily and I, I just started a field course or helped to start a field course in the Bahamas, um, bringing students to Abaco. Um, and then I found out about this job here at KP Luther Institute and came and checked it out and was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, this is the kind of place that I could come back to. And I got the job um, first as the assistant director and then got promoted to, to director. So, and here I am coming up to almost three years back in the Bahamas, um, which, you know, I have absolutely love it here. Um, back close to my family and an amazing place to bring up my own children. So I do want to ask you a little bit more about your experience at the Natural History Museum, which mm -hmm. amazing museum. I have not had the chance yet to visit it, but I know you, um, I remember reading that you worked on the taxonomic field guide for deep sea creatures. Yes. Yeah, so what was yeah. that like? Were you ever surprised by any of these creatures? Did you find some misclassifications? Like, how was that experience doing that? <laughs> well, that, um, that was really what we were doing was trying to, to really create something that was accessible to the public um, where we could really open up the world of the deep sea. And, you know, this is a theme that we'll keep talking about today, I'm sure, is that because it's deep, dark, far away, it's inaccessible, it's hard to picture. And, and so what we were trying to do is say, okay, let's get the best pictures that we could find of some of these animals. And so we had a, a kind of, which is hard, right? Because there's not many people been down there. Yeah. And we had a lot of back and forth stuff about like how good the pictures had to be because we wanted something that was like high end, you know, like we didn't want to create something that, that wasn't going to be attractive. Um, but as far as, as working at the museum, it like I, I just kind of fell in love with museums for many, many reasons. I love, firstly, it has the most amazing library. It's full of old books. I probably spent like a year of my PhD rummaging through this old library, researching stuff. It just like, is amazing. Um, but I guess one of the greatest things is interacting with all these different experts who are like the best people in the world for this particular group of yeah. animals. Um, and, and so that was another really great thing about that project is I got to work with people who, you know, not just from the museum, but all over the world who specialized in particular groups of animals. So um, who would check our lists and say, hey, you're missing a whole bunch of species um, or, you know, or this species is not really deep sea. I don't know how it got in there. <laughs> and that kind of thing. So we did a lot of work also just trying to build a comprehensive list. So that was a big part of the whole project was to say, like, how many species do we know about um, in the deep sea? And, and that is still one of the big unanswered questions, you know, and actually it has a huge impact on how we understand life on Earth, because the biggest unknown in our question of how many species live on Earth, how many different types of living thing are on Earth? We, we don't know. Um, and most, a lot of that comes down to the uncertainty around how many species there are living in the deep ocean. Um, and, and estimates vary wildly from, you know, some people think there's maybe one or two million species down there. Others are like 10 million. Um, and that's, that's like the reasonable estimates. Right. Some of them are like 50 million. We know about... Um, a few hundred thousand, like 800,000 so far described, I think, maybe a little bit more. I should not know that number off the top of my head, but... No pressure. <laughs> but I am curious, and I'm sure some of our viewers may be wondering this as well, but you just had mentioned that some of the experts had said this is technically not a deep sea creature. It, it's not classified in that section. So at what depth does the deep sea actually start? <laughs> well, <right? laughs> that, that was another... This is another thing that right. like, biologists often... Um, about. So, so really when we're talking about deep sea, what we mean is that part of the ocean 
where sunlight doesn't penetrate. So that differs, differs in different parts of the world. Generally, we're talking of anything below two to 300 meters. So below, you know, um, 700 feet, say, depending on uh, what you're working in. And, but somewhere here like the Bahamas, the Bahamas actually has some of the clearest waters in the world. So the sunlight penetrates a lot deeper. Um, in fact, one of the, the records, I think, for the deepest uh, photosynthetic organism was discovered on a seamount off San Salvador here in the Bahamas. Um, so the, the deepest kind of, um, that was a, a coralline algae, like an encrusting algae found on a rock at like 300 meters, I think, which is normally, you normally would not even find any traces of sunlight that deep. So, so really we're talking about um, deep sea. And then the question was, okay, well, what, what counts as something living in the deep sea? Does it have to, is it any animals that may go that deep? You know, like, um, there's, there's some great talks at the last Bahamas Natural History Conference, um, say on like shark diving behaviors, where we saw, you know, um, tiger sharks will routinely go down to a, a few hundred meters. Some other sharks go down to 300 meters. Um, Deep diving whales. So um, yeah. the Bahamas Marine Mammal Research Organization do a lot of work on the deep diving whales in the Bahamas, these beaked whales and sperm whales. And in my mind, they are deep sea animals, even though they breathe air, because yeah. they spend most of their life down in the deep, hunting, interacting ecologically. And they really just come up because they still got to breathe air because they're mammals. So they come up, get some air. And then they back down there. So, but this is a big debate. Like that was a huge thing: is what what counts as deep sea? Um, and 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 we we had to we didn't know it at the time, but we were kind of like had to try and settle some of these debates within the community. So, it it was um, there's a really interesting exercise. And then that that app. One thing that was really cool about that was that we started getting feedback that not just like the general public were enjoying it, but like people were using it on ships to kind of figure out like what they were seeing on deep sea cruises and videos and expeditions. Yeah. Because, you know, like the average scientist cannot know about every everything, right? You, you right. have a limited field of, of knowledge. And so, you know, I certainly don't know everything, you know, all different kinds of animals there are. So. Sometimes you generally see stuff in the deep sea and you're like, what, what in the world is that? I don't even know <laughs> what kind of animal that is. Like literally the other day, yeah. um, I was on Twitter going back and forth with <laughs> like, world experts. Yeah. And like, like, is it a sponge? Is it a jellyfish? Is it a type of sea cucumber? Like that's how weird some of these forms of life are. Um, you know, there, there was some, controversy in like 2012, um, some scientists published what they thought was a whole new phylum of animals. And that's like the highest level classification. So that's like, you know, um, like the classification of say, um, vertebrates versus echinoderms versus worms. Mm -hmm. And they, they said they discovered a whole new phylum um, because they found these things that nobody could figure out what they were. Right. Um, they since shown that they were actually um, a type of jellyfish, but they looked so weird, people didn't know what they were. So the deep sea is full of these weird and wonderful, strange life forms, um, some of which you don't really see much of in the shallow waters. And the reason for that is, well, there's, there's many reasons, but one of the, the reasons that people think the deep sea looks strange at the, and the animals there look kind of strange um, is because it's that defining feature that there's no sunlight, right? So we, as animals, we live off of sunlight. We, we, we see the world through reflected light. That's, that's what we use. When you're living in the dark depths of the oceans, there's hardly any light, um, almost none. And a lot of animals use other ways to hunt or find food, chemical signals, sound signals like the whales. Um, and so it's a different world and they're completely adapted to living in a whole different world. Um, and, and, and that's all that pressure that, too, right? Like mm -hmm. just that deep, all the atmospheric pressure that's on top of them, that also kind of affects how they're physically, you know, 
looking yeah. at, which we don't have all that pressure to deal with. No, exactly. And some animals are okay because they, they kind of maintain their internal body pressure at the same pressure as the outside. But there, you know, there are some of these deep sea fish, especially the ones that live really, really deep in the trenches, that if you try and bring them up to the surface, their whole, the body just falls apart because their cells are built to, to function at those kind of pressures. Um, and that, that's one thing that's really tricky trying to do biodiversity work in the deep ocean yeah. is that as soon as you bring stuff up and it gets warm, so especially here in the Bahamas, you've got to keep the samples cold. Otherwise, they, they, the DNA starts to disintegrate and you can't even get good DNA samples to work out what, um, what these animals are. Because half of the time, you know, typically you might bring up maybe a quarter of the species would be new. To science that you wow. might bring up now the other thing is a, a lot of the stuff in the deep ocean is um is pretty small so but very diverse so some parts of the deep sea can be um as as diverse as as a rainforest um we know that and in fact i'll just bring let me just bring up a picture to illustrate this yeah one second, one second yeah yeah and I don't know why you do that. We do have one question that popped up on just what is the largest deep sea creature, which I guess is, is a bit ambiguous, right? Because what is a deep sea creature again? So, Well, we know that the, um, yeah, I mean, one of the most amazing discoveries recently was filming um, the giant squid, um, which is the longest um, uh, deep sea species. And they live entirely in the deep sea. They'd never been seen alive until um, I think it was 2012. And then a couple of years ago, my colleague here from the Cape Luther Institute was actually on the expedition where they filmed one live in the Gulf of Mexico. Nice. Um, which was amazing. So, you know, these, there, there are some really big things. The other big things that we get in the deep oceans are these giant, um, isopods, which are like these little roly poly pill bugs, but they. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say they look like that. Yeah, well, they're, they're related. They're, they're very closely related. Um, <laughs> and they're big scavengers down there, but they're like bigger than your hand. Um, they're absolutely huge. And we have them, you know, right here off the Bahamas. Um, so let's pull up this. Yeah, definitely. I want to see some pictures now. And I'm sure a lot of our viewers are very interested to see what's in the deep sea. And I know I had had a behind the scenes kind of thing going a little before the episode where I feel like as a human race, the human race invests so much money into going into space and not enough, in my opinion, into going into the deep sea. Like, I think, why weren't those billionaires racing to go down to the deep sea? They wanted to race to go to space. OK, well, I think the deep sea is more I interesting. Mean they are doing that too. So there, there was a um, expedition over the last couple of years called the Five Deeps, where um, this guy actually went down. Um, oh, here we go. And went to all the deepest points, the five deepest points on the earth. Um, James Cameron built um, his own deep sea submersible to go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Um, so there has been this kind of, um, I guess, inner space race, as we call it. Um, and, and actually, the, a lot of the, the, the work that we've done here has been through um, these philanthropists who are kind of part-time ocean explorers. Um, right. So we, we've, been, we've done about three or four missions off Eleuther here with the Ocean X. Um, foundation, which funded um, their, their um, research vessel to come here and take us down in submersible. So that was like the highlight of my life, was getting to go <laughs> in one of these deep sea submersibles. Highlight of your life, okay. <laughs> oh, what, one of them, okay. I should, <laughs> along with getting married and my children there being married and all that kind of stuff. There you go. <laughs> Definitely one of them is the safer way to <laughs> put that. But I had seen some pictures of that, and I, I'm definitely excited for us to dive in a bit more about how that was for you guys. And let me get your pictures up on the screen. Oh. Okay, so this, 
This picture is um, from my friend uh, Craig McLean, and this is the diversity of animals that was came from one tablespoon of mud. Um, wow. From the and all of those are a different species. Um, as you can see close to that, that penny, um, they're all very, very tiny. Mm -hmm. But when you look under a microscope, they're, they're absolutely um, amazing animals to look at. Um, and they're incredibly diverse. Again, just one tablespoon of mud had this many species in it. And the reason they're small is because a lot of the deep sea um, basically relies on the food that falls down from the surface. Uh, so like dead plankton um, that we call marine snow. And occasionally um, larger dead animals like dead fish and dead whales also are like this huge food bonanza in, in the deep ocean. A buffet. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that—that's actually what I did my um, my PhD on. The whale falls. Yeah. So that was uh, <laughs> this one. Nice. So this this is actually a photo that I took using a uh, underwater robot off Japan. Um, that was one of the great things about doing a PhD was that I got to travel all over the world um, and do some really cool projects and being a Bahamian living overseas, I'd never been anywhere really besides the Bahamas and England back and yeah. forth, you know. Yeah. Every vacation, you're like, oh, I want to go see my family. So you go back home to see your family. Um, but doing a PhD really allowed me to travel and see the world. I went to Japan, California, did a lot of work in Sweden. Wow. It was amazing, Italy. Um, and so, yeah, I was studying, looking at um, how these kind of big, yeah, uh, food falls create their own little community in the deep sea where you got to imagine there's hardly any food arriving in the deep sea. It's just this fine snow of dead plankton. Right. And then something like a whale falls down. It's, it's a huge event um, and sustains kind of these, these communities for years and years. But, and so how deep was that picture, the one you just showed us? Oh, let me just stop sharing. Oh, that was... Uh, 1,300 meters, so what's that, like 4,000 feet? Wow. And that, yeah. that's not deep, deep. I mean, a lot of folks that I work with will routinely be doing stuff at um, 4,000 meters. So which is, it's kind of the depth um, really of the seabed just on the eastern side of Luthor, where I am. So this is the other thing. A lot of people in the Bahamas don't realize that we have some amazing deep water habitats we do. in the Bahamas. We have these huge canyons with cliffs that are almost vertical, that are like two and a half or three miles high, um, way taller than the Grand Canyon, um, and almost as big a canyon system in between. So up where I grew up in Spanish Wells, and between there mm -hmm. and South Abaco is this huge, huge, the mouth of this huge canyon, the Great Bahama Canyon, um, which as far as we know is some of the steepest cliff walls in the whole ocean. Um, and that's why the guys at the, um, studying the whales at the Bahamas Marine Mammal Research Organization based in Abaco, um, they, they get some great encounters because these whales are basically living on these cliffs traveling yeah. up and down, feeding around these, these cliff areas. But um, there, it's amazing underwater scenery, and it, it's almost hard to describe um, without being there. And that was one of the great things about going in this submersible into, into like, the deep sea here is that you go over the edge of this drop-off, um, and then there's these, all these kind of big hills and valleys and hummocks, um, and the landscape is just surreal. Um, it, it's, it's almost not really like anything you see on land. Awesome. But. So before we dive a bit more into your experience in that submersible, I do want to play our quick little commercial from our sponsors, and then we'll jump back into your experience going into the deep. Okay. <laughs> what do defensive linemen, speed bumps, and the corners of coffee tables all have in common with mangroves? They all stand in the way of fast-moving and potentially destructive forces. Believe it or not, 
Mangroves are not only essential to our ecosystem, they are also the first line of defense against the winds and surges of hurricanes. They help to protect our property, our economy, and our very lives. The Bahamas Protective Areas Fund is committed to protecting Bahamian mangroves, and we're making it easy for you to do the same. Link up to protect the mangroves by raising funds to plant and preserve our country's most important natural defenses. Just $12 plants a single mangrove tree, while $25,000 plants an acre. Every contribution counts. Help defend the Bahamas for this generation and the next. Visit bahamasprotected.com slash link up to learn how you, your family, or your organization can link up to protect the mangroves. Awesome. So, again... I want to hear what it was like for you going down in a submersible. How deep did you get to go? Uh, we went down to about 700 meters. Um, so that's like maybe 23, 2400 feet. Nice. Um, and, and that really, the submersibles we were in only went down to a max of 1,000 meters. But um, the, where we are, the, the, um, just off the, the edge of Eleuthera on, on the western side, um, is actually the northern part of the Exuma Sound Trough, which goes down to about 3,000 meters. So um, the, the, the submersible that I was in was basically a big acrylic sphere, so a big transparent sphere, um, so you can see all around you. And as it starts to go down, you're in the kind of typical open ocean blue water. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever swam in the open ocean blue water, but it's a, it's a pretty cool experience because you it's can't see around you. Yeah. And so you start to descend and the light slowly starts to fade. Um, and you start seeing all these little <coughs> creatures in the water. And as it gets darker, um, sometimes you, you go past an animal and you see a little flash and a glow. Um, and that's this thing called bioluminescence, which... Uh is everywhere in the deep sea actually. It's very, very common that animals will make their own light for different reasons, but um, usually they're just like these little flashes when you disturb an animal. Um, and it takes a long time. It takes like, you know, uh, half an hour to an hour to get down to those kind of depths of wow. just going down in the submersible, yeah. So, you know, those kind of, that kind of journey down there and back um, and doing that kind of science takes like three or four hours um, to, do the, to do those kind of things. But so you go down deeper and deeper and deeper. And then um, when we got on the bottom, the, the bottom where we were was this kind of white um, muddy ooze, um, which is because the, the Bahamas um, is, is this amazing carbonate factory where you you get um, these sands and muds being created. And so all of that is, is tumbling down the slopes gradually, sometimes not so gradually, sometimes in these big avalanches called turbidity. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, and if you get caught up on one of those in the submersible, you're very unlucky and very much in trouble. It's like an underwater avalanche. Um, but we, we were on these kind of muddy slopes and then you'd see these like rocky outcrops where maybe there was a boulder or something that had tumbled down the cliff. And on that, there might be um, this, these little corals or a, a crinoid, which is um, a type of um, a relative of a starfish, but they, they stalk. Um, so they kind of look like um, brittle stars that are on stalks. Let's see if I can um, pull up a, a picture of some of these animals. But um, yeah, it, it's, let me just uh, see if I can bring up some photos. And while you do that, there is a question that's asking about some of these deep sea creatures. Um, from Kevin Glinton, there's been a lot of talk of exploiting Bahamian deep sea and pelagic species commercially. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the problem with exploiting, there are deep sea fisheries around the world. Um, one of the issues is that we know of is that because as you go deeper, the temperature generally goes down. Um, the the rate at which animals live and move um, on average kind of decreases. So the fish that live at depth um, take much longer to reproduce on average than the fish we find in the shallow waters. Um, so these fisheries 
are very um, easily overexploited. Um, so it's possible. Um, and I guess the, the classic story of that is the or orange roughy fish off New Zealand. Um, that was kind of very boom and bust. You know, they, they discovered these huge populations. And I think we're probably seeing that now um, here in the Bahamas in some areas. I, I know fishermen will tell you some areas where they would deep drop for snapper uh, mm. have kind of been been fished out. Um, I don't, you know, I don't think we're anywhere near um, depleting whole populations of these animals. But I think we're already getting to the point where we're seeing certain spots where fishermen have known to be good deep sea fishing spots yeah. um, becoming overexploited. And so I, there is a little bit of a worry there. I mean, it, it's possible, but we just have to set our expectations very differently from the level of fishing that we would do in shallow waters because those fish, they just don't reproduce as fast as the fish here. And so it takes longer for the population to build. So we can, we can fish some of that, but you know, um, it, it takes a lot longer. Now, invertebrates are a little bit different. Um, they, they might be a little bit more numerous, um, but again, maybe I know there's been talk of looking into the golden crabs, which live down there um, and some deep water shrimp species. Again, it, it's possible, but it's, um, you need, there needs to be a lot more work done to look at what the appropriate level of fishing effort is. Um, the reason people get interested about deep sea fisheries species is because it's a huge, huge area. You know, um, you, you think of the area of the Bahamian archipelago and double that, and that's how much deep sea we have. Because our deep sea territory, our territory extends 200 miles out from the edge of the land into the Atlantic. So if you, we have this huge area of deep ocean. Um, that the Bahamas has rights to the fisheries and the minerals in there too, which is becoming an increasingly hot topic um, in, in ocean science. Yeah. I know uh, he also has a follow-up about, is this sustainable? So I guess it would be based on the information that we have about the particular target species. Yeah. I mean, the, I guess it all depends on the level of fishing. Um, and yeah. I, I suspect that um intensive fishing is no is not sustainable in in the deep sea certainly in the bahamas because it, it also comes down to the basic energetics right um other people have, have mentioned this um that you know the reason we have these clear turquoise waters is because the waters are not hugely productive there's not as much plankton being generated in the waters as say in more temperate climates um, and so there's not as much food reaching these deep sea ecosystems. Um, and therefore they're, they're probably not as productive as say some of the other deep water areas off of Cape Cod and Newfoundland um, yeah. in the North Atlantic. Interesting. And dare I say, I know I have my friend watching from the Cook Islands, um, deep sea mining. Do you have any particular thoughts on something <laughs> like that? Well, <laughs> I, I I recently actually in uh, one of the last thing trips I made before the pandemic in 2019 was I represented the Bahamas government at a um, workshop on deep sea mining nice. to determine um, environmental regulations for deep sea mining in the mid Atlantic. Um, and I mean, maybe a lot of Bahamians aren't aware of this, but um, we actually have a stake in what happens in the global ocean um, by virtue of the fact that we, we the Bahamas, has signed up to um, the, in, the International Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. And what that does is it manages all the resources in the, ocean, in the seabed beyond national jurisdiction. So what I said earlier is that the Bahamas has rights to everything within 200 miles. Yeah. beyond 200 miles that is deemed to be the, the um common property of all mankind so that's the question right beyond the 200 miles who owns the ocean and this is a huge question going on right now the wild west out there <laughs> yeah. and so the the international seabed authority exists to manage the resources 
um, particularly and right now the hot topic is on the, the mineral resources in the deep ocean because there are a lot of um, particularly um, metals like copper, nickel, um, manganese that are needed for the technology that we use every day for our batteries in our phones and laptops, um, materials needed to make um, some of this equipment, especially now that renewables are increasing, we need more and more of these raw materials. And one of the places that people are th looking to is potentially the deep ocean because there are a ton of, of those minerals just sitting on the seafloor there. Right. Um, the problem is we know very little about what the potential impacts are. And also going back to what I was saying about how um, life works down in the deep ocean, we know that recovery from disturbance events takes a long time in the deep sea. So how long would it take if you like mined a huge area of the deep sea floor? We, we don't know. And, and that's really what the workshop that I was at on behalf of the Bahamas was all about, was trying to define the parameters under which deep sea mining could possibly happen right. in this area of international seabed that's not owned by anybody, but might potentially affect the Bahamas. You know, say they, you know, released some, some chemical accidentally during mining that drifted through the, through the oceans and ended up um, impact in the Bahamas. Those are the kind of questions that we were asking at this workshop is like, okay, how is mining going to work? What's the feasibility of, you know, the impacts? How far are the impacts going to spread? What's an acceptable impact or an acceptable trade-offs? And particularly what areas should be completely off limits? Right. Um, and that that's, we just had a paper come out um, defining that, well, using scientific cr criteria to define which areas, particularly active hydrothermal vents, which are these amazing ecosystems mm -hmm. in the deep ocean that are fueled by um, hot water springs in the deep ocean. So we kind of said that those are off limits. The problem is those are the systems which generate the minerals that the people are after. So um, it, you know, that's got to be managed very, very carefully. Um, and I think you know, a part of this big global push for this blue economy um, you know, when you hear that word, that means things like ocean mining, not just fisheries and, and livelihoods as well. Yeah. Um, so, but there's a huge amount of money being invested into this right now. And it's, it's kind of been dominating the world of deep sea science almost for, for the last 10 years. Yeah, and so we do have another question from the Cook Islands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she asks, you mentioned how reliant deep sea creatures are on the food from the surface. Is this is the same true in reverse? What are some of the roles of the deep sea and its creatures in the wider ocean ecosystem? That's a beautiful that, one. That is a really good question and something that I, I am fascinated by, um, you know, is how the, the whole ocean system is linked. Um, and one thing that happens in the deep sea is um, nutrients get recycled. And in a lot of areas, you, you get deep ocean currents um, pushing up against the continents, causing upwelling of deep water. So where basically this, this cold deep water is being pushed up to the surface. And that deep water is full of nutrients um, that have been recycled in the deep ocean. And that fertilizes the surface waters. So sometimes you get these huge blooms of plankton where you get these areas of upwelling because it basically the deep sea is, has recycled all these nutrients and then is pumping them back up into the surface waters. So if that wasn't happening, the global productivity of the oceans would be, um, uh, would be much, much reduced. So there is this, this inherent cycle there. Um, but also, um, the, you know, there are links in all sorts of ways. So a lot of deep sea animals spend their early life stages at the surface of the ocean. Um, so that's it. These animals that live thousands of meters below the seabed, they will release their eggs or their larvae and those float up to the surface and they live in the surface um, and float around and disperse before moving back down into the deeps. Um, and in fact, we know that well, what is called the largest migration on earth happens every day 
um, as these um, midwater fish move up and down through the water column to feed. Um, and then, so they feed, they move up at night um, to feed and then move back down to the deep um, and, and basically um, poop down there and live down there and come back and forth. And they, they're effectively, they're, there's so many fish doing this that they are changing the chemistry of the ocean by doing that. They're moving nutrients back and forth. Wow. Um, so it's really, you know, the, the, the deep sea covers 60% or more than 60% of the surface of the planet. So the scale of this, this wow. system has a massive effect on the deep ocean. It also absorbs a ton of heat from the atmosphere. So, and that's the oceans in general, but a lot of that ends up, um, is, is sequestered along with CO2 in, into the deep sea. Um, and that's a really, a really big thing that I'm interested in here is looking at carbon sequestration in the deep sea. Yeah. So um, the Bahamas is, is a really cool place to study that. So one thing that I noticed on my submersible dives that mm -hmm. there's a couple of things that I, even as a deep sea scientist, I was like, wow, that's weird. Was <laughs> when we were down deep, there was tons of seagrass down there. None, none of it live, all dead seagrass. And what was happening was that a huge amount of the seagrass being produced on the banks, the dead seagrass was getting washed over the edge and going down into these deep sea canyons. And what that represents is a huge transfer of carbon from the shallow water system into the deep ocean. Okay, so a ton of seagrass and algae think, yeah, you know, like all the turtle grass or um, sargatum. Yeah. When that sinks into the deep ocean, um, it effectively gets sequestered away. And so even though that might get broken down by microbes and the carbon dioxide is released back into the water, that water does not then touch the, the sur surface of the ocean again for thousands of years. So effectively that carbon is then locked away. And so places like the Bahamas and particularly the canyon are really, really important for sucking carbon out of the atmosphere because wow. our productive mangrove and seagrass systems, they fix the carbon. They use CO2, you know, the plants, right? And the plankton, they, they take CO2 out of the atmosphere and lock it away in the leaves or other plant material. That then gets exported into the deep sea and locked away. So the Bahamas, is like this amazing carbon pump that's sucking carbon dioxide out of the surface waters and out of the atmosphere and pumping it down into the deep ocean. And the reason that happens is because we have this juxtaposition of these very extensive seagrass and mangrove systems that are very effective and efficient at locking away carbon, very, very close to deep water drop-offs. So before, all of that detritus, that dead seagrass and, and mangrove material can get broken down and recycled, it, it makes its way down into the deep ocean um, and gets locked away. So the Bahamas is, is a hot spot for that. And when I was on my submersible dive, yeah, there was just seagrass all over the seafloor at like five, 600 meters deep. Um, and, and we're trying to analyze the video and footage from that now to try and kind of estimate um, really how important that might be as a way of locking away carbon. Um, but it, it's, and so there's this, this deep connection between what's happening in the, in the shallow waters and what's happening in the deep sea. Because some of that will be food for animals living in the deep ocean as well. Some animals will rely on that food source down there. Um, in fact, the, the project that I mentioned before that first got me interested in the deep sea that my professor done in the Bahamas was looking at these strange animals that live only on wood in the deep ocean. So <laughs> there's no there's no trees in the deep ocean, right? There's no right. plants living down there. <laughs> but there are animals that are adapted to only living on wood in the deep ocean. So they are 100% reliant on logs and trees falling into the sea and washing out and sinking. And they spend their entire life eating away these these logs and trees and producing little babies that'll then float around and hopefully one day find another log or tree to live on. Every um, parents wish that your, your larvae will float away and find their own log. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and meanwhile, you're slowly eating, eating away your own house. So yeah. you've, got to, you've got to make enough babies 
larvae to <laughs> find another home before you eat away in your own house. Otherwise, you'll never survive. But it's, it blows my mind that there are whole animals that just live on something like that in the deep ocean. It really sounds like the deep sea creatures and the deep sea as a whole is this like unsung hero of the earth, right? Like we don't pay much attention to it, but it's doing so much for us, you know? And I yeah. think even when you think about climate change, right? Like you, we always hear, oh, you know, the ocean and the temperatures. Yeah, if we start getting too hot, is it that some of the CO2 will then start coming up and getting released if the deep sea starts warming up as well? Well, that's, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a lot of unknowns there about how the ocean is going to react because a lot of that depends on how, um, how the currents um, change. So for one example, there's a lot of concern, and this is, you know, for us is about how changing global temperatures are affecting the, the, the Gulf Stream um, and, and the North Atlantic current. So if that slows down, um, that basically removes this way of transferring heat from the tropics where we are to the poles. Um, if that current slows down, that's going to completely change the Atlantic climate. Um, and, and there's evidence and we've got evidence now that that is slowing down that, that, that basically that conveyor belt of heat, that current, that deep sea conveyor belt mm -hmm. is, is slowing down. Um, because of temperature differences and temperature gradients. Um, so it, it's really uncertain and it, I mean, there, there are some really great, that's more on the physical oceanography side. So some of my more oceanography colleagues have been studying this. And in fact, one of the best lines of evidence for this is based on a series of moorings that stretch from the Bahamas all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so that, that experiment, was kind of starting when I first went to university in Southampton, there's a couple of professors there um, that kind of set up this array of deep sea moorings to measure the deep sea currents. Um, but certainly, yeah, that, that's one possibility is that we're gonna start seeing the dynamics of how the ocean um, exchanges CO2 and heat um, is, is, gonna, is gonna potentially change as well. And so I know you mentioned it a bit earlier in the episode, this project that you're working on, the ID Map app. Wasn't it an app you were saying? Yeah, it's actually, um, it was, it's been around for a while now. That was 2012. We came out with what we call this deep sea ID app. Um, and we, it, it exists online on the, the World Register of Deep Sea Species. Um, okay. You can also download it as an app, the deep sea ID app. So that the, the online, it's basically the app is basically feeds off of this online database, which comes from the World Register of Marine Species, which is like basically exists to try and catalog all the marine life on earth, which is this amazing, amazing effort. Um, and it, it's kind of like the go-to place of scientists to check um, things like species names. So um, hot tip, the scientific name of the conch was recently revised. I saw. Yeah. So if you want to go and check, you know, what's the scientific, what's the accepted scientific name of the conch, that's where you go, the World Register of Marine Species. And so we made a deep sea section of that called the World Register of Deep Sea Species to try and come up with this definitive list of, of known deep sea species. And then what we did was then take that a step further and try and see how many of them can we get a good photo for, a good image to give us a, a kind of, and the answer is not very many at all. Yeah, I was gonna say, it must be really hard to kind of catch up with them. <laughs> but you know what, like it, the deep, the world of deep sea scientists is a small community. When I was first doing my PhD, like it, there was like a total of 300 people max at our conferences around the world. It's since grown a lot because of um, this increasing amount of science that's being done around deep sea mining and other things. Um, but it's still a small community and, and everybody, you know, in the, in the world of science is usually willing to help out. And people donated hundreds of images that they've taken for free, um, helped us out with revising some of the species lists. And then we were really just kind of putting this all together. Um, but it, it really was like a global team effort. Um, Oh, and then so we ended up with this just catalog of, of amazing um, images. But I don't have the app 
up, but um, I can share some of the images that we got from our deep sea work here in the Bahamas. I would love to see it because you guys at the Cape Luther Institute really are doing some amazing things from the deep sea to the shallows, but today's about the deep sea. Maybe we'll get some more guests from the Cape Luther Institute in the future. Wink, wink, director. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do we got here? We got, oh, these are some little squid that we picked up. Ooh. Um, and then some other ones. So these, these I should say, are all like close-ups, um, detailed images. All kinds of little fish. So you can see a lot of this stuff is, is pretty small. Yeah. Um, so it's quite big. Um, oh, I love these. So I, when I was doing my PhD, I was in a worm lab. Um, this is a sea cucumber, by the way. What? Um, so sea cucumbers are some of the most abundant sea cucumbers and sea stars and crinoids. When I was talking about um, crinoids, mm -hmm. these are, are crinoids. They're called feather stars. So they're related to um, brittle, brittle stars and sea stars. So they're, they're animals. So this thing is living on um, a whip and they're very much animals so they can move around. So those, those feathers, they yeah. can use those to swim or to crawl along the seabed. If you want to see some really cool video, um, <laughs> videos on the um, the Bahamas Natural History Conference from 2016, Chuck Messing, who okay. is a world expert on crinoids, um, did, a, did a presentation. Um, and there's some amazing video on there. But yeah, I'm going to find that and then post that on the page today because all this is so amazing. This is. And I, yeah, I can send you a video of, of my dive as well. Um, we can post up. So this is a, a brittle star living on a bubblegum coral. So, I mean, that's one thing. There's tons and tons of deep sea corals um, that form these kind of sea fan-like structures, except they don't have, um, they don't rely on sunlight. They filter, they filter feed, but they kind of act as reefs that all sorts of other animals live on. Mm -hmm. um, this is another type of sea cucumber. It's not a great picture because it's in a bucket. Um, but this lives in the water swimming around. And it's, you can see it kind of started to fall apart after we brought it up to the surface because it's so oh. fragile. Mm -hmm. So it's so hard to pre preserve some of these things sometimes. So these crinoids are also called sea lilies because they look a little bit like lilies. So you can, you can see there's a lot of sea stars, brittle stars, and corals, sea whips. So this is sea whips, the mother bubblegum corals here. Um, lots of kind of bristle worms. So these, these things live in the mud. I love worms. Um, when you look at these things under a microscope, they have amazing anatomy and biology um, that do all sorts of things. So uh, let's see if I can find. Some of them have these uh, predators in the deep ocean where they have the, these jaws inside. So these little black pieces here. Yeah. Uh, jaws that are inside their mouth that they shoot out to grab animals living on the seabed. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, just, this is, this, and this will all um, come, you know, all these worms will be living in the mud unseen. Just this huge diversity of life. Really cool little crabs and shrimp and other things down there. You can see this is a little label. You can see how tiny some of these things are. Um, I'm surprised that some of them actually have pretty colors, like that red sea cucumber, and even those little crabs have these nice shades of orange. Yeah. So red is um, red is actually a very common color for animals to have in the deep sea because mm -hmm. red light doesn't is gets filtered out first by the ocean. So as the sunlight goes down deeper and deeper, the red light disappears first. And that, that's why things look very blue down mm -hmm. in the sea. So a lot of um, deep sea creatures that do use light um, will often be red because they can produce bioluminescence um, and still kind of remain a little bit invisible. So you see a lot of shrimp and crustaceans are often red in the deep ocean. Um, but sometimes you do occasionally get other colors, um, but usually where you see other colors are like bioluminescence, when they light up blue or green um, down there. And we still don't know exactly why they're doing that. Some animals, like famously the anglerfish, use it yeah. to attract prey. 
Some we think use it as a defense mechanism to kind of like a burglar alarm to signal like, hey, I'm being attacked. So, something big, come and eat this thing that's attacking me. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's actually how they got the footage of the giant squid alive for the first time, was they used some lights that mimicked a jellyfish bioluminescence. So oh it, it, was, it was like this LED lights going around in a circle and it, it mimicked this particular type of jellyfish um, that we think the squid um, prey on. And so the squid are, are looking out for these little flashes um, to find their food. So if something wants to draw, so if this jellyfish, you know, what, something wants to draw attention to this jellyfish and call over this big deep sea squid, it'll start flashing and say, hey, come over here, come over here, eat this thing that's trying to eat me. Nice. And so, the, you know, all of this, sometimes this light is so subtle, it's imperceptible to our eyes. Because again, our eyes are built for a world that's flooded with light. But in, in that kind of darkness, all of this stuff can be going on. And sometimes we use special cameras, low light cameras to detect all of this. So um, that's another thing that's just really cool about studying deep sea animals. Is sometimes their biology is just so different and weird. Um, you, you kind of are opened up to, to kind of whole, whole new worlds, like deep sea vents and stuff like that. Yeah. So here we have a, a, a comment um, from mm -hmm. Haley saying she wants to go into submersible because um, it'd be so excited to go on exploration, which leads me to one of my like closing questions. You know, how could somebody like a student or even just the average Bahamian who's interested in getting involved in some of this research or learning more about it or just even getting in a submersible with you guys, how can they get involved with the Cape Luther Institute studying this stuff? Yeah, I mean, well, one thing, <laughs> um, we we actually took some of our students out um, and we're trying to actually set up a partnership now where we'll have regular access to some of these submersibles. So one of the problems before is, which it kind of very much depends on getting funding and access to these facilities. And you never know when that's going to happen, so it's hard to plan. We're trying to set up a partnership where we might get more regular access nice. to be able to explore the deep sea more. and. A part of that will be to take out um, interns and students um, to be a part of these expeditions. And that's one thing that we've done on every expedition. We try to take out students, including our um, scholars on our BEST program, our Bahamas Environmental Stewards program. Um, some of those have been out on our expeditions. Nice. The other thing that I, I would like to do is one of the problems with being the, the director of, of a lab like this is you don't get as much time as you'd like to do your own research. And I would love, I'm kind of trying to put together funding now for a, a project, um, perhaps a PhD, to kind of synthesize what we know about Bahamian deep sea ecosystems and really drive some of this research forward. Um, so if, um, particularly, you know, if you're kind of more at the undergraduate um, or master's level and think this is a really cool area of science that you want to pursue, I would love to hear from you. Um, you know, that opportunity doesn't exist, but it all starts with, with relationships there. And um, hopefully we can build that into something because what I would like to see is, is, you know, like the next expert in deep sea science being um, a Bahamian, you know. So much of our, our deep sea exploration has happened by people from other countries because they have the resources to access it, right? Yeah. And so I've also been talking to other deep sea colleagues about developing more low tech um, ways to explore the deep ocean with like drop cameras and things, whereby it can just become a more routine part of the science that we do here, rather than needing these big ships and huge submersibles, which are great and amazing and yeah. allow us to do something. But also, can we get some more low tech um, ways of more routinely exploring the deep sea and involving more people? So. Um, I'd say, yeah, do apply to come and work with us as an intern or as a best scholar. Um, you know, we, we have lots of opportunities for people to come and work with us. So please, please get in touch um, with me or, or through our website for sure. Do you guys have an age limit for interns? Yeah, for so our, our interns um, really are usually um, definitely over 18. I think we'd say preferably over 21. Um, kind of pursuing a career in, in environmental science or conservation. 
Um, now, our, our best program is more open to high school age students. Right. So that's, um, that's run through brief. Um, so every year that's, um, we have two groups go through that program. Um, so yeah, that there's opportunities there. Um, and then, or if you know, if you're a Bahamian who's, um, away at college studying and interested in doing this for an undergraduate project or something, I'd love to hear from you. Um, or like I say, if you're even more advanced and thinking about doing a PhD, um, I'd definitely love to talk to you about that as well. So really there's opportunities at, at every level um, to get involved. And like I say, maybe with some more of these different technologies, um, we'll be more routinely getting schools involved. All right. And so we did have one last question um, asking, what is the deepest part of the ocean and where it is? And I think I know the answer, but- Ooh, I'll let's catch your knowledge, go on, go. The Mariana Trench? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I just don't know where that is. I just always know that that's the deepest point. Where it's, is that? It's in the um, in the western part of the Pacific Ocean. So, um, if you imagine, in your, roughly, very roughly in your head, um, Japan go further out into the Pacific and further south, and it's kind of in that ballpark area there. Um, okay. So yeah, that's that's the deepest. But the Puerto Rico Trench here in the Atlantic um, gets pretty deep too. Um, I think that goes down to nine or 10,000 meters. Um, I, might have, I might be speaking, I gotta look that up. But Puerto Rico Trench is very, very deep and that's not too far from us at all. Nice. And so last question before we say goodbye to all our viewers. What is your favorite sea creature and why? <laughs> well, I think I gotta go for the creature that I did my PhD on, um, which was the uh, bone-eating snot flower worm. Say that again. Bone-eating snot flower worm. So you mentioned, I mentioned these animals that live only in wood. <laughs> that this worm, I love worms. The worm, they're beautiful, amazing animals. This worm lives only on the skeletons of dead whales in the deep ocean. Interesting. And all the big ones are females and That's all the males know. are tiny little microscopic dwarfs and all the females have these harems of dwarf males. So, uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and so, one more time, it's the bone eating snot flower it? worm. And the reason is, it looks like it looks like this little palm tree. It's like this beautiful pink palm tree with these pink plumes that are its gills. And then it's got this mucus tube, um, okay. and it it lives on it lives on the bones of whale skeletons, and it dissolves them with this root-like tissue that grows into the bone and sucks up the nutrients. It's, it, so the biology of this thing is amazing. It doesn't have any mouth or gut. It has these bacteria inside of it that help dissolve the bone and suck up the nutrients. And it, it's a very cool animal. And I got, I got to study it for three years. It was probably like some of the most weird biology you could imagine. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a great project. Um, Unfortunately, probably not something you spend your entire career doing. So I kind of moved on to, to lots of different things, but it was definitely a um, very, very cool animal. So go and look it up. They're called Ossidax. That's the Latin name. You type in Ossidax. That's the easier I mean, Nice. Do you have any final thoughts for our viewers? Words of advice, inspirations from the deep sea? <laughs> I would say just go with the flow, you know, um, like, I started out wanting to be a marine biologist who was going to go and study coral reefs and, and dolphins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and what I kept going along that road, and at every turn, I realized, oh, being a marine biologist might be this instead of this, might be this instead of this. And I didn't end up going to the, back to the Bahamas straight away. I ended up going all over the world studying these really cool deep sea ecosystems. Um, and because I went with the opportunities that presented themselves. And, you know, at the end of the day, now I'm in a position to study the things that I think are most interesting. Um, so, you know, just keep going with it um, and, you know, um, work hard and um, be thankful, you know, because I know I am. I'm thankful to be back here and thankful to be able to do this job that I love.
And you know what? We're so thankful to have you back here in the Bahamas. And I'm sure there'll be so many more great things to come from you and the Cape Luther Institute. So thank you so much for taking the time on your Sunday afternoon to join me on my episode of Siren Sundays. I look forward to hearing from you more in the future. Hopefully one day I will get out to the Cape Luther Institute. Maybe yes. take a break and do an internship <laughs> for a couple of months there. Thank you all for listening. And thank you so much for the invitation, Ashanti. Definitely. And to all my viewers, thank you for once again tuning in to another episode of Siren Sundays. See you guys next Sunday and have a great afternoon. Bye, everyone.